what was once a small trading centre established by the British would grow into a multinational port of call for traders, merchants and people from all over the world. This was also a new era of technological advancements for our small nation, a time of change. It would impact our lives in more ways than we can imagine. Once this was the seat of power, the resting place of pioneers and people of faith. It's a memory landmark of our childhood years and of our lives in modern times. The Hill has seen all of the major events that shaped us into who we are today. From here, we can tell seven centuries of our story, our history from the Hills. Modern Singapore, bustling, cosmopolitan, connected, modern. This is a story about some of the most remarkable technologies that have made our island into what it is today. We take much of it for granted, but its roots can be traced back to nearly 200 years ago, as the early residents celebrated the new era of invention during the colonial age. The impetus to develop Singapore in the second half of the 19th century was more because of the opening of the Suez Canal, coupled with a more systematic administration, colonial administration put in place after London took it over. Singapore then became the commercial administrative capital of a new British colony in Malaya. Singapore, Malacca and Penang, the streets settlement here. From the beginning of Singapore as a port city after the British settlement was founded by Raffles, Singapore soon became a bustling port and within a couple of decades was out competing Jakarta and some of the other major ports in the region because of the free trade system and things like that. So this new port in Singapore was a boom to everyone interested in making money to come here and there was no taxes, you could set up a shop and start making money right away. It was during this period of economic and population boom that many of the early technologies arrived on the island. Some of these landmarks still stand on Fort Canning Hill today. In the early half of the 19th century, the hill was named Bukit Bandara or Flagstaff Hill due to the presence of a flagpole on top of the hill that overlooks the town. Completed in the 1820s, it was built by the British to inform the early residents of Singapore of the arrival of a form of modern communication that we take for granted these days, mail. That flagstaff play an important role in terms of communication. Okay, um, main thing is that uh, uh, it notifies the residents of uh, incoming mail ship. So it would fly a red flag if uh, a ship from Europe has arrived, and uh, it would fly a yellow flag uh, if a ship from the Far East has arrived. And the entire city would erupt with people carrying huge bags of mail down to the post office to get rid of all the things that they had been preparing and to, to send away, and then also to receive all the new mail and, all the new, and also newspapers and magazines and books and other things that arrived in the postal system and then take them back to all of their shops and houses. We take the idea of travel for granted these days. But during the 1820s, the journey by sea from Europe to Singapore took more than five or six months. If you were to send a letter to England and received a reply within 10 months, this was considered very punctual. So the arrival of ships carrying mail and parcels was more than just something to look forward to if you lived in the early 19th century. This was an event. Professor John Van Wy of the National University of Singapore has been studying the colonial postal system for more than six years. So in the middle of the 19th century, Singapore was already the communications hub of the entire region. 
not only was all the mail coming to and from Singapore, from Europe, but also from the entire Dutch Indies and from China. Everything came through Singapore. The Singapore Post Office, with just a few men, processed over 30,000 letters every month, something like 400,000 letters a year. And that was in the 1850s. So a lot more mail was coming in and out of Singapore than we would currently imagine. So it was already then at the International Communications Hub. Just near the foothills of Fort Canning lies perhaps a quite forgotten reminder of this early technology. The Philatelic Museum showcases more than 200 years of our postal history. Many of the letters that are exhibited here date back to the early 1800s, when letters took nearly six months to arrive by sailing ships. Many were written even before the invention of the stem itself. Senior curator Lucille Yap has been researching and documenting the postal system on the island. When Raffles came in 1819, he brought along with him the British postal system. Well, it started off with uh, sailing ships where they you know, carried the mails along with them. The route they took was uh, you know, a very long route known as the Horseshoe Route, meaning they go around the um, continent of Africa, uh, around the tip of the Cape of Good Hope, before coming around to India and then to Singapore. And it was uh, initially under the military, uh, but subsequently it was passed on to the master attendants. But subsequently, with the thriving port, um, the post office is very much needed. So then a postmaster was appointed and uh, a post office was set up. The first mail office, known simply as the Post Office, was a single room located in the previous Parliament House. As the influx of new mail increased, the Singapore Post Office was constructed near the Town Hall by the side of the Singapore River. Letters arriving from ships would be sorted before sending them out by the postman for delivery. These would be delivered by means of bullock cart, horse carriage or on foot. One of the most important occupations in early colonial Singapore was the man who delivered these letters and packages to the residents here, the 19th century postman. Okay, let me introduce you to our early postman. Okay, this is how a Malay postman would look like. Basically, he would have a bag, yeah, and he would have this very important item with him, which is the wax umbrella, because Singapore weather is uh, not just hot, but you know, we have thunderstorms as well. So we have to keep the, not just himself dry, but the mail dry as well. And he would be barefoot, yeah? So that kind of safe cost, because he has to walk a lot, so go barefoot, doesn't have to change footwear. At times, however, the way they started work was quite different from what we're used to today. In the night, uh, obviously, you will not be able to see the flag. Uh, yeah. uh, so to notify the residents of the arrival of mail ships, a cannon would be fired. The cannon was actually on Fort Canning Hill as well. Sailing to Southeast Asia from Europe, however, was still costly and time-consuming. But during the 1840s, something quite radical at the time was introduced. It would revolutionise the way people and mail would be transported from all over the world to Singapore. And it would also change the way of life of people in Singapore. Early 19th century Singapore. Abdullah bin Abdul Qadir, better known as Munshi Abdullah, a celebrated Malay author and good friend of William Farquhar and Sir Stanford Raffles, describes what captured his imagination in his book, Hikayat Abdullah, or The Story of Abdullah. This was one of the few recorded local accounts of events in early Singapore. Therefore, I truly believed that they did really exist, although I was trusting only a rumour, not yet having seen what they looked like. In spite of this, I used to tell all of my friends about the skill and ingenuity of the white man. The things that I had seen and had heard intelligent Englishmen discuss 
until I came to the subject of steamships. Then my friends became angry and argued with me, calling me a liar and saying, you always magnify the prowess of the English and tell us the most impossible things. And some of them ridiculed me for telling them that steamships really existed. The comparison to make between the speed of mail coming on sailing ships and that coming on steamships and railways is unlike any comparison you can make in our time. Because in our time, what, what are the differences you have? You have the difference maybe between an email and an instant message. The difference is not that great. Whereas the difference they experienced was huge. So they really felt that they were living in the modern age, the most cutting edge technology the world had ever seen. And they were right. The invention of the steam engine would improve the way of life for the people. The very first mail service paddle steamer, the Lady Mary Wood, docked in Singapore in August of 1845. This was a landmark event. Some of the first steamships that came to visit the island took approximately 41 days to arrive from London, a record that was unprecedented at the time. Instead of going all the way around Africa, which took so long, they developed a new route to go through the Mediterranean to get off at Egypt, and then you had to go across the desert for a little stretch, which is why this route was called the Overland Route, even though it was all by sea, except for that little tiny bit. And then they would get on another steamship, go down the Red Sea, around Sri Lanka, up past Penang, and then arrive at Singapore. That route would take only 44 days instead of three or four months, and it was completely regular like clockwork. This new age led to the creation of what was then known as New Harbour in 1852. The new port had excellent facilities to accommodate the growing number of steamships. The Singapore Postal Service also had to expand to cope with this growing demand. In 1873, a new general post office was built on the site of the former Fort Fullerton, a location that was much nearer to the commercial centre of the town, and one that we all know today. The Fullerton building, which, is, which was the general post office, located right at the waterfront, was the ideal location. And of course, the mail volume was uh, tremendous. Yeah. And uh, we had this postal counter that was reputed to be the longest in Southeast Asia. It actually ran from the entrance facing the waterfront, facing Collar Key, all the way to the other end of the building. And one of the early inventions during the colonial era were prime examples of the power of communication. Many of them can still be found near Fort Canning today. Senior curator Lucille Yap from the Philatelic Museum has been translating and documenting old postcards that depict early life on the island. It started off as a very simple uh, card, which we call the stationary card, meaning that it has no picture on it. It's uh, just mainly for you to write your address and write a, a short message, and then you send it. It's like what we call today as the, uh, the SMS of today. Yeah? It's just a short message, faster, cheaper way of uh, communicating. Yeah? But with the advance of uh, photography, technology, pictures, uh, taken were printed onto these cards and so they are called picture post cards. When it started off, it was very simple. Pictures was on one side and the reverse side was for address. So uh, they forgot to leave space for messages. So very often you see messages being scribbled over uh, on the photo side, on the picture side. And in around 1906, uh, they introduced the split back. So the back where the address was supposed to be written was split into half. So on the right side, you write the address of the recipient and on the left side, you can write your message. So the picture remained on the front. Yeah. Then with uh, improvement in uh, photography technique, uh, photographs, actual photographs were used as postcards instead of having pictures printed on the on a card. So we call those photograph postcards. Yeah. 
So, um, you know, this has continued till today, and we still use uh, photo postcards still today with the split back, uh, be it the people of the country, the sceneries, uh, the development of the countries, all these are captured on picture postcards. And these postcards, uh, over time, like now we look back at them, they become archival documents. Some are basically travellers' tales, you know, their observation of Singapore. Like some talk about how busy we were and they compare us to Paris, you know. It's like Paris of the East. Also the people, there was one on a picture of uh, some Malay boys at a kampong swimming in the river. And so the observation was that they are so uh, carefree. Yeah, and they could enjoy you know, swimming in the river. And some talk about um, our crops here, uh, the, the great variety of fruits, and uh, also talk about rubber plantation, where there are postcards of rubber trees uh, with uh, people tapping the rubber. And uh, you know, they describe the whole process even. Yeah. So these are some interesting uh, you know, information that we can gather uh, about the life back then. Many new advancements in technology would usher early Singapore into the modern age. Just by the foothills of Fort Canning lies a small road that tells us an important technological legacy of the times. It's a story of how our forefathers moved around the island back in the day. Now, this black line crosses the Singapore River uh -huh. towards Fort Canning, and we are, sure, sure. we are not at this part of Fort Canning. We, we should be going over the other end. Yep. Okay. Right? Peter Chan and Jerome Lim, both heritage bloggers, have had a long passion for the history and heritage of Singapore and the early railway systems that crisscrossed the landscapes. They're now on a quest to find the elusive colonial roadway system that once ran through Fort Canning. As a young child, probably I was only around about seven years old. Um, trains, anything that moves, uh, certainly would catch my attention. And trains uh, were no exception. And the fact that I actually seen a lot of trains in the Kampong Baru area, that actually sort of propelled me to know more about the very first train system in Singapore. That is the... Uh... River Valley swimming pool. And over there, uh, mm. there used to be a lot of go downs. Sure. And behind those go downs um, is the Singapore River. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that the track mm -hmm. once ran across the Singapore River in that direction. So if we hurry over there, I think we should be able to find sure. it. So the railway actually represented quite a significant, you know, um, sort of uh, you know advancement in in the way people could be moved about, goods could be moved about. Uh, to Singapore and also to the peninsula. So that, that was actually an important uh, means, uh, a trade wing that was established uh, because Singapore was also where the main port was. Over here, right now you see this construction. Mm -hmm. This used to be the goods uh, marshalling yard mm -hmm. of the old railway system. Mm -hmm. Over that side you see Clemenceau Avenue that yeah. runs all the way there to oh. Tang Road. That used to be the old railway line. Okay. And that railway line went all the way up to the new harbour, mm -hmm. Keppel Harbour. Oh. Okay. So it's quite interesting that now we have actually a new new railway in a sense, the mm -hmm. MRT line actually running here. Right. So right. Right. What, what what do you call this? Uh I think this is called uh, Fort Canning Station. That was actually the um, original name for that railway station. Oh, oh, oh it was okay. called Fort oh. Canning Station before okay. you actually move up to the okay. other side there. And they call it Tank Road Station. I see. The Tank Road Railway Station, located within the vicinity of Fort Canning Hill, served as a terminal station that ferried goods and passengers from the city centre up north to Kranji via the Singapore Kranji Railway Line. This line linked Tank Road to Woodlands in the north. From there, a ferry could take you across the straits. At that point in time, in moving people or goods uh, around places in Singapore, uh, you would have bullock carts, right? You would have uh, rickshaws. And of course, when you had the locomotive, the trains, uh, it represented a new form of technology because it was steam-based. So the locomotives were steam-based and it required a lot of uh, fuel. In those days, fuels were things like uh, 
the coal. So that's why you, you, you had um, coal stations at uh, the dockyard areas, which actually fed onto the trains. You see. Steam technology began uh, for industrial needs in the mining industry. It was originally used to pump water out of mines. And then it was realized that you could take these powerful engines that were being developed and power other things with them. So then the first railways came about. that You could put them on wheels and you could drag heavy weights long distances very, very rapidly, faster than anything had ever moved before, faster than a galloping horse. Uh, in fact, when the first trains came about, people were worried that it might be dangerous if you were to travel on a train at speed like that, it might somehow destroy your body because no human being had ever traveled that quickly before. The train will come from uh, Keppel Harbour, mm. go under here, mm. go over to the other side, which okay. is Chinatown. Right? Mm. So if you look back down here, this is where you can see the track that went under the bridge. The train will come from there mm. and it will come over this side and it goes under this road bridge. Right, and uh, it would travel over the side towards Chinatown. It was serving the needs of the Tanyong Paga Wharf area. So okay. all the goods from the ship that were sure. unloaded, okay. they were put into on the train, and then the train would bring it down. Okay. Here. And this was actually an extension of the line. Yeah, right. correct. Okay. It was an extension. Of the and line. the motivation was actually to bring it to the wharf. Yes, correct. Okay, because the Keppel Harbour uh, wharf was just built around the same time as this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh wow. Okay. So. Actually, this is the first instance of a rail corridor preservation yeah. in Singapore. Right, right. When you look at the steam locomotives which were deployed on our train uh, systems, uh, it was actually the, um, at the tip of the uh, Industrial Revolution. You would realize that steam actually was one of the byproducts of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, with steam, you could actually use to propel a lot of things. Electricity in those days was expensive or hardly uh, being produced. Unlike today, when you have your MRT system where everything runs on electricity. So at that point, I would say uh, steam was the equivalent of electricity as what you have today. And we are talking of the early turn of the 20th century. The structures around Fort Canning are small reminders of the technologies of a forgotten era. One that has gone through nearly 200 years of change and propelled a backwater trading port into one of the most advanced communications and trading hubs of the region.